So today's the first day of celebration for Advent and Hanukkah as well. And I told Pastor Reed, there's got to be a message in there somewhere. So uh, here we go. Advent is about adoring Jesus. And if you go into, uh, you know, quite a few churches anywhere, uh, as they prepare for Advent, you might come into the door and see like a, a large wreath. And on that wreath will be surrounded by four candles. Three of them are purple, one of them is pink, and a large white candle in the middle. And today is when they, uh, a number of churches, they'll light the first purple candle, the candle of prophecy. Uh, the other candles are the Bethlehem candle, the shepherd's candle, the angel's candle, and the candle in the center in white is the Christ candle. And it's a uh, holiday, and it's a season for uh, adoring Jesus and knowing the prophecies about him. There's a lot of them in the scriptures. And Advent not only validates that God is faithful to his promises, but also it verifies that Jesus is the spoken of and promised Messiah to all of us. Jesus and only Jesus fulfilled all of the over a thousand prophecies. And the mathematical odds, I think someone has figured those out, they're astronomical. Only they were centuries and centuries before the birth of the Lord. And for all of those thousands of prophecies to absolutely be fulfilled by Jesus, the odds of that are like virtually none. There's so many zeros, we couldn't have time today to put all the zeros up on the screen. But it's amazing. Uh, of all the prophecies of the coming Messiah in the Old Testament, prophecies like these, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, spend his infancy in Egypt, be the target of infanticide, raised in Nazareth, be despised and rejected by men. All of those were spoken by various prophets six to 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And if that wasn't enough, because right, we're going to take a tour through the Bible today, I'd like us to consider that Jesus is the undying flame in the light of Hanukkah. So buckle your seatbelts up. Uh, we're going to go, we're going to span the scriptures uh, today, tracing the lineage of the seed, capital S, of the woman that was found in the Garden of Eden, all the way back in Genesis chapter 3, all the way to Bethlehem, and explain the promises, the prophecies of the one who gave them. Let's pray and get started. Father, thank you for uh, the message that you have showed that you'd like me to give to the people of God this morning. It's not my message, it's your message. And I pray that people's hearts and minds are open to receive. As the Lord said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear this morning. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the last couple of years, I've been the first at Cross Life Church to be able to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. It's, it's cool to be able to be the first one to wish everybody a Merry Christmas. And uh, the Christmas season in the church, we speak about uh, Advent. Right? It's called Advent because Advent is Latin, and it means Adventus, which is the Latin word, and it means coming. It means a coming to or an arrival, and it's the coming of the Messiah into the world the very first time in Bethlehem, in the incarnation, and that's called the advent of Jesus. And by the way, Jesus said in the gospel of John, I am the bread of life, and Bethlehem, Bethlehem means in Hebrew, the house of bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. And of course, the church looks forward right, to the return of Jesus, which is called his second advent. But during the Christmas season, we're concerned uh, mostly is that initial advent 2,000 years ago, his first coming into the world. Now, in this message, uh, I'd like to direct our attention to the New Testament, a passage of Scripture that's like rarely, if ever used, as part of the 
Christmas message. We know all the the uh, passages from Luke and all the others that are important to the uh, Christmas season, but this one, it's like never used, and that's from the first chapter of the Apostle Paul's letter to the Romans. And let's look for a minute at Paul's opening greetings and salutations in that book of Romans. And when you see them, it's like they're even further removed, you know, than uh, you really think about. But when you look at this passage closer, I think you'll see uh, quickly and clearly how significant and inappropriate it is for Christmas, for Advent. Paul begins his letter to the Romans with these words, all right, which are on the screen. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. So as we look at that passage in Romans, probably Paul's most profound letter that he wrote, it begins with the normal uh, identification of who he is, his credentials as apostle. He declares himself as a bondservant. Now in Greek, that literally means a slave, a slave who's bound to the Lord Jesus, an apostle who has been commissioned by Jesus to represent his teachings to the church. But when you notice in the opening lines here that Paul speaks of being called for a particular mission, what's that mission? His task is to proclaim the gospel of God. Now, when you look closely at the gospel of God, usually, you know, we think about gospel, and that means the good news. And we think about uh, one of the books, one of the biographies that was written in the New Testament, written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or as uh, a message in the letters about the person and the works of Jesus. All those are true. But when Paul speaks about the gospel of God, some people may think that those words mean he's about to give the good news about God. And that's not really what it means. The grammatical form, the gospel of God, is a form of possession. Now We could rewrite this, and it would say words like this, that Paul is set apart and called to preach God's gospel that the gospel is something that is God's possession. It comes from God. It's God's message, God's announcements, God's good news. That's what's being entrusted to all of the apostles who are set apart by God to proclaim that message. This isn't Paul's gospel. This is not the church's gospel. It's not invented by any human being but it's a message that belongs to God. It comes from God and is communicated through his apostles. Now, this gospel that comes to us from God, what does it concern? First, it's a gospel that God has promised beforehand. So often in the New Testament, biblical writers refer to works of Jesus, such as Jesus' atonement, the resurrection, anything dealing with a redemptive history. The biblical writers will say that Jesus died according to the Scriptures, or that he rose again according to the Scriptures. Well, at the very outset of this proclamation of the gospel, we see that the advent or the coming or arriving of Jesus, his birth, the incarnation, is also according to the scriptures. This is something that distinguishes uh, this Christian faith from any kind of mythology because uh, the Christian faith is grounded in truth, actual history. Now, for the Greeks, with all of their myths and their activities of their gods and goddesses, they weren't related to history at all. That was pure mythology. 
you know anything about the birth of Athena, goddess of wisdom, how did she come to be? She was born from Zeus after he experienced an enormous headache, and suddenly she sprung, fully grown and dressed in a suit of armor from his forehead. And so you have this, you know, the mythological characters that they don't have anything to do with real historical fact and reality. But when Paul speaks and writes about the coming of Jesus and the coming of the gospel that proclaims that coming, he's not talking about mythology, something that just springs uh, brand new onto the scene or some type of, you know, new history. But it's an actual historical event that God promised centuries and centuries and centuries before it ever came to pass. And so there's a vast period of history that precedes the coming of the Messiah. Now that's important for us who are living today in the 21st century, and we're still waiting for the second advent of our Lord. And he said he's coming soon. Now one of the frequent comments that you hear from people or complaints is, hey, we've been waiting for over 2,000 years. And Jesus still hasn't returned yet. Or, you know, maybe it's just a myth. Or maybe he's not coming back at all. And that's exactly the same kind of doubt and discouragement and the disbelieving attitude that people in the first century had with respect to that very first advent. They needed the scriptures. They knew that centuries before, the prophets predicted that Messiah would come. And generation after generation after generation, they waited. They waited eagerly. They waited expectantly. They were looking and longing for the Messiah to come. But he didn't come. And after a while, people began to say, he's never coming. Our faith is simply mythology. The coming doesn't really relate to real history or real time. But the Apostle Paul, now speaking in the first century, is saying that the gospel that he's proclaiming is something that God himself promised through all of those prophets. Now let's take a look at the origins of the promise. The first promise that we uh, find in sacred scripture in the Bible concerning the coming of Messiah is uh, often called in theological terms proto-evangel, and that's just fancy for the first gospel. Where do you find that? It's all the way in the book of Genesis, the third chapter. Now, normally when you think about the third chapter of Genesis, you think of the record of the fall of the human race. Because this is the chapter that gives us the narrative, the story of the temptation that the servant brought to Adam and Eve and of their epic fail in that test. But after Adam and Eve sinned and they fled from the presence of God, they hid. God comes and confronts his creatures. God gives a curse to fallen humanity. He curses the land. He curses the man. He curses the woman, and he curses the serpent. Now, we know that the land uh, is cursed, so that instead now, instead of willingly yielding uh, its fruit for agricultural purposes, the land is filled with thorns, and it will be difficult in the bearing of that fruit from the ground. Man is now cursed with frustration, hard labor, that will accompany the work that he's been given. Now, don't you know, misunderstand, work is not the curse. Uh, God put Adam and Eve to work in the Garden of Eden before there was even a fall. But now what is associated with the labor of uh, people is the sweat, the sweat and toil of the brow, the frustration, the pain and grief that's involved in our earthly jobs, our earthly labors. But what we're concerned about this morning is the curse that's given to the serpent. And this begins in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, you are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. 
and on your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Now notice that that's capital S after her. That's somebody special. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, when you look at that, that's the gospel. That's the first one. It's a cryptic message. It's a cryptic prophecy that's in there. It barely hints of a future that's going to unfold in redemptive history. In context, this is God's angry denunciation of Satan as he manifests himself in the form of that snake. So God curses the serpent, and he said, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all the cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go, and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity, now that means estrangement or hatred, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Now, when the Scripture speaks of the seed of the woman, God's speaking about Eve's descendants. And if we look carefully at this uh, prophetic text, there's a particular, there's a singular significance of that seed that's to come. It focuses on one of the descendants of Eve, a man-child who will come forth at some period of time in the future out of the loins of Eve and of her descendants whose destiny will be to crush the head of the serpent. And yet, at the same time, the serpent's head will be crushed. The heel of this man-child, the seed of Eve, will be bruised. The image here is of a man crushing a snake to death by stepping on his head with his foot. But in the process, he bruises his own heel. Now, this has been seen uh, for centuries by the church as an image of the atonement of Jesus, an image of the cross where Jesus puts to death the work of the devil. He crushes Satan by offering his perfect atonement for sins, which he redeems his people and he brings them out of bondage. But the cost to that seed of the woman is that he could only accomplish this redemption through his own suffering, through his own death. The wound that's inflicted on Messiah is not permanent, but it's fatal. But it's not final, for God raises him from the dead. And so from the earliest passages in the Old Testament, as promises made about the future, about the one who's to come who will crush the head of evil and bring about the redemption of God's people. Now as vague and as cryptic as that prophecy is in Genesis chapter 3, it gradually begins to increase as the passing of time occurs in the Old Testament. Prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet expands and enlarges on the promises of God and of this one who is to come. I've tried to count, and I've lost count of how many, but they, the uh, experts say uh, on the coming of the Messiah, there are the prophecies number in the thousands. There will be one who is to come, who will be like Moses, who will mediate a brand new covenant for his people. There will be one to come, who will be like David, who the prophet Amos suggests will restore the fallen booth of David. Now, David was the greatest king in all of Israel, extending from the northern borders of Dan all the way to the southern borders of Beersheba in the south. And he made this tiny nation, which is about the size of Maryland, it's about the size of New Jersey, he made it into a world superpower. He brought untold wealth to that country, an industrial complex to that Jewish nation. David inaugurated what has always been called the golden age of Israel. But within one generation... During the reign of David's son, Solomon, 
the golden age began to tarnish. And by the second generation, it turned to rust when the kingdom split between Rehoboam, that was the son of Solomon, and Jeroboam, who was an administrator of Solomon. And thereafter, Israel would long for the restoration of the kingdom, for a kingship that would mirror and reflect the graciousness, the greatness of the heir of David. So the prophet Amos said that the one who would come would restore the fallen booth of David. Now prophet after prophet, image after image, none is more graphic than found in the writings of the prophet Isaiah. In the ninth chapter of Isaiah's book, Isaiah gives this very well-known prophecy that has become fundamental right, to the image, the pageantry of Christmas. In the ninth chapter of Isaiah, beginning with the sixth verse, the prophet says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Do you see what Isaiah, do you see what the prophet is saying here about the Messiah? Who is to come? He's prophesying on the advent of the anointed one. That's what Christos, that's what Messiah means, the anointed one. And he's saying that the Messiah will be born. Unto us a child is born. And if we look at the Christmas story in the New Testament, when the angel announces the birth of Jesus to the shepherds in the field of Bethlehem, the angelic host say to the shepherd, Okay, thank you. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Now seven centuries, that's a long time before that, the prophet Isaiah announces the birth of a child, not just to you, but to the whole nation. For unto, not you, for unto us, unto us a child is born, unto us a child is given. And this child who will be born will receive vast honors, many titles, and he'll be called Wonderful. He'll be called Counselor. He'll be called the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father and the Prince of Peace. He will receive a government that will be on his shoulders, and it will be the government that was first seen in its greatness in King David. And of the end of his reign, the Messiah's reign, there will be no terminal point. There will be no finishing. It will be everlasting. Let's finish by uh, this section by going back to the book of Romans again, where Paul said, in chapter 1, verse 1 to 6, Paul, a bondservant, a slave of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. That's God's gospel. Which he promised before through the prophets 
in the Holy Scriptures concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through Him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for His name among whom you are also called of Jesus Christ. That the prophets spoke concerning God's Son, Jesus, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, but was declared to be the Son of God according to the Spirit of God. This is what we celebrate in the Christmas season, what we celebrate in Advent, the coming the arrival of the one who was promised and who has indeed come. Now, as we live our lives before the face of God, uh, let me ask this morning, if you've ever experienced that sense of doubt that Jesus is going to return, or a sense of frustration about the promises of God, it seemed like so many times God works so slow. Doesn't it seem that way? So that we begin to live in despair, wondering if he'll ever perform the promises that he's made to us. And yet the scriptures tell us those promises of God are without doubt. Hopefully you remember from my last unforgettable message (laughs) that when God spoke to Habakkuk, and said to him that these things would certainly come to pass, even though they may tarry. Wait! Wait for them! Wait! The people of God in the Old Testament were those that were willing to wait. They were willing to wait for the advent of Messiah. Even as today we look back at the fulfillment of all those promises for the final advent of our Lord Jesus, I hope that we have that same devotion, the same confidence about the absolute trustworthiness of God's promise that he's made to us that those people of God had way back in antiquity. Uh, The next slide is from Isaiah chapter 9. And it talks about light. Light is significant in the Scriptures. You read about it a lot. And the prophet Isaiah said, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Now, uh, you might have been wondering, and maybe it's even been bothering you since 1030, what is Gary doing with a Hanukkah menorah? in church. Remember that Hanukkah begins this evening. It's interesting. The symbolism is it's fairly amazing. Hanukkah is overshadowed uh, by Advent and the Christmas season. Hanukkah is also known as the Festival of Lights, also the Feast of Dedication. And it reveals that the menorah's undying flame is actually symbolic of the light of Jesus. And it graphically illustrates, it illuminates Jesus' life and ministry, even if it's currently unrecognized by our Jewish brothers and sisters. Now, Hanukkah is commonly known as the festival of lights, but in Hebrew, Hanukkah actually means dedication. The history of this is is amazing, if you like history, to go back and look at the period called the Maccabean Revolt. And it happens, even though it's not in the Bible, it happens right here. From this page to this page, there's a 400 years of silence, no prophetic word from God. It's during this time that Hanukkah happens. Now, after three years of guerrilla warfare a band of Jewish rebels that were called the Maccabees. That means the Hammerers. They triumphantly entered and liberated the defiled 
and half demolished temple in 164 BC and rededicated that temple to the service of God. Now, many uh, Christians know uh, that Jesus, when he was in that same temple, said in John chapter 8, verse 12, which also lets John chapter 10 come into context, Jesus said this in the temple in John chapter 8. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am. Now, in Greek, that's ego emi. Now, that's significant really significant. When they translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, God's personal name, back in Genesis uh, chapter 3, when he spoke to Moses, who should I say is, you know, sending me? Tell them, I am who I am. That's God's personal name. So when Jesus says this, in the scriptures, in the temple, he says, ego emi in Greek. And the Jews realize, man, that's God's personal name, God's holy name. And he's, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now, many, uh, you might not know, today that we find this holiday in the scriptures. What? Hanukkah is in the scriptures? Jesus celebrated Hanukkah, and it's recorded in John chapter 10. Jesus would come to Jerusalem for the holidays. Pastor Rick last week talked about Passover. Jesus would come to Jerusalem, and again he came for this celebration, the Feast of Dedication. Now, it was the Feast of Dedication, a.k.a. Hanukkah, in Jerusalem, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple and Solomon's porch. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt or suspense? If you are the Messiah, if you are the Christ, tell us plainly. A few verses later, Jesus declares I and my father are one. Man, it was shocking. It was shocking. It was on Hanukkah that Jesus boldly and publicly revealed his Messiahship by proclaiming to all the people there, I and, and the father are one. Now, the undying eternal flame of the temple menorah, which was a seven uh branch candelabra, and when you think of uh, the Jewish faith, what pops into your head is that menorah, and it was central to the worship in Israel, that undying flame had been extinguished when the temple was uh, half destroyed. The Greeks had desecrated almost all of the sacred oil used for that menorah, and there was only a small container remaining, only good enough and long enough to last one day. It would take eight days more for the priest to consecrate more olive oil to use in the menorah. Nevertheless, the Maccabees had that faith and trust, and they lit the menorah. It burned for one day, and then something happened. The menorah kept burning for eight full days. Now, Judah Maccabee, he was uh, the leader of that uh, group, he, he was the one who declared that there would be a commemoration of this every year, an annual holiday, the Feast of Dedication. The people also referred to it as the Festival of Lights. Now, as the holiday became more and more popular, uh, a tradition of making small menorahs for uh, houses right, began in the Jewish homes at that time. Now, these menorahs are different. Uh, they have one more branch instead of seven. They have eight because of the eight days of the oil burning in the temple. Now, the symbolism here uh, becomes interesting. So there's eight branches, and there's one candle that goes uh, each day. But there's a ninth branch to this Hanukkah menorah. 
Now, this is where the symbolism comes in. This one, if you notice, is elevated. It's exalted more than any of the eight on that menorah. Now, that center candle has a name. It's called the Shamash. What does that mean? It means servant. So here you have a servant that's elevated, that's exalted over the others. Sound similar yet to anybody that you know? Now that servant candle comes down. The candle comes down that's elevated and exalted, and it's the candle that passes its light to the other candles. Now, the other candles, like, you know, usually in Christmas Eve services, they have uh, candlelight services that one will pass the light, will pass the light. Not on this. It is the servant candle that comes down from its exalted position, and it's the candle that passes its light to the other candles. So it's highly symbolic. It's a, kind of like a uh, reenacting of the incarnation. Now, as we make that mad rush during the uh, Christmas season to that Bethlehem manger in anticipation of Christmas and the birth of Jesus, let's pause just for a minute at the menorah and look and contemplate its meaning and symbolism. When we look at it, we see a beautiful portrait of Jesus. Each candle is and has to be specifically lit by that servant, the Shemash, the servant candle. Scripture teaches us that Jesus is God's servant, the servant of the Lord. It says in Matthew, Behold, my servant, God's servant, I have chosen. And in the book of Philippians, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. And this servant, this Shamash, is the light of the world. Jesus is the true light that has come into the world and illuminates all of us. He's the eternal and the undying flame, which spreads its light, his light, one candle, one person at a time. Now, the rededication of the temple was a turning point in Jewish history. That magnificent temple, it no longer stands. It was destroyed in 70 A.D. by the Romans. Now, the New Testament teaches that all of us, each individual here, is now the temple of God. How can we dedicate or rededicate our personal temple of God? The answer found in two prominent symbols, oil and light. Do we let our light shine? before men that they glorify our Father in heaven? Or do we choose to hide our light under a bushel? In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. Who gives light to all who are in the house? Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let me ask, how's your oil burning today? Sometimes we might need an oil change. Sometimes we're just a quart low. Maybe we feel like all I have left is like one day supply. I don't know if you're old enough to remember this one. This old Christian kids tune they used to sing in uh, Bible schools. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Anybody ever heard it, that one before? It's a song that they sang. Uh, it's a good song. Now, it's reassuring to remember that the Bible teaches us that more oil is always available to us. 
when that undying flame has been ignited in our heart and soul by Jesus. So let's focus on the menorah and remember that we have been illuminated by that servant, the servant of the Lord. And we have an eternal supply of oil right, to keep that undying flame burning in our hearts throughout the year. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I just thank you for the symbolism of Hanukkah and for the message of the Advent, the coming. And we know that you're coming back. We know, Father, that the, the Lord Jesus has come, come to Israel. And for sure, without doubt, that he's coming back. But friend, has he come into your heart? Has he set your heart on fire, aflame? Have you given the Lord your full trust in him, a Savior and Lord? And for my Christian brothers and sisters this morning, do you need some more oil? All you have to do is ask. I'm going to give you a, a minute to, to pray to the Lord. And if there's never been a time where you've asked him to illumine your heart, that you trusted him fully for your salvation, or maybe you need that more oil, would you just take a minute and pray to the Lord right now? Father, please hear our prayers this morning for we ask them in the name of the Holy One, the Messiah, the Christos, the Lord Jesus. It is his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for uh, being here today. For uh, those that don't give online, we have offering baskets in the back that also has the flyer for Leave 99. Make sure that you pick one up. Um, if there's any uh, requests of anything that we could do until Pastor Rick, I think he said he's coming back uh, tomorrow. All right, please write down. We'd be more than happy to do uh, anything for you here at Cross Life. Uh, just let us know. And now that our worship is over, let the service to the Lord begin again with gladness. Go safe in the spirit this week. Go trusting in God's goodness. Go spreading God's kindness. Stay centered on the Lord Jesus and where he may lead. Would you please stand and receive God's word of benediction and blessing that's found in Romans chapter 15. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit now and forevermore. Amen.